Hello, good afternoon. Um, we're about to get started. Welcome to the Blended Meat panel. Uh, my name is Denise Ataman. I'm the Deputy Editor at Food Navigator USA and very excited to speak with our esteemed panelists here, all who have a blend of perspectives on the blended meat scene. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and so, yes, very excited to have this conversation, which I believe is one of the first discussions at Good Food Conference um, on this topic. So before we get started, though, I just wanted to remind everyone a few housekeeping um, notes. If you go to the Swap Card app, uh, we'll be conducting a few polls throughout the discussion um, that we encourage you to participate in. And then if you have any questions that you'd like to submit, um, I'll be checking the app throughout and you know, trying to try my best to incorporate those questions as we go along. Um, so um, yes, as we you know, get started, um, you know, this conversation is gonna be, or this topic is quite different, um, I think from a lot of the conversations that we've heard today. Um, still diversifying you know, alternative protein productions, but um, I think from a more reducitarian point of view and you know, blended meat, which is a mix of conventional meat with plant-based materials, um, you know, has a lot of potentials that we're going to be talking about today. And so uh, first off, I wanted to go down the line here um, so everybody could introduce themselves. And uh, yeah, Prendy, we'll start with you. Sounds good. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Perendi Birdie, and that is my real last name. I'm always asked that in these alt-protein circles. So that's my real last name. Um, I've been involved in the alt-protein sector um, for about 10 years now. So in 2013, I learned about this crazy idea. It was called in vitro meat. And while most of the world kind of wrote it off as just some crazy idea, there was about a, a dozen or so people that were seriously dedicated to making it a reality. And pretty much overnight, I was one of those people. So I got a degree in biochemistry and did everything I could to help advance the field. So I was one of the early team members at Good Meat, and then a few years later, Mission Barnes, and helped build both startups from the ground up. So everything from kind of setting the overall vision, the strategic path, hiring the team, um, and I loved it. I have a background in chemistry, as I mentioned, so I did a lot of work on the technical side of things to get started. So did a lot of work on the cell line and media development areas, but kind of being um, an entrepreneur at heart, I was always drawn to the, to the business side. So I did a lot of work in um, helping create departments in marketing and business development, operations, HR, finance, you name it. Essentially what I did was create a department, ran it for some time, and then hired a team of experts to actually take it over and run it. And so I did that for several years. And then about six months ago, I just wanted to take a step back and see if I'm doing the most impactful thing. I wanted to see if there's potentially any critical white space that could be explored. And kind of through that process, it was kind of a long, soul-searching process. Um, I ended up creating this long 40-page Google Doc with all sorts of ideas for companies and projects and nonprofits. Um, I did a lot of work with the incredible FSI, Food Systems Innovation. If you don't know them, you should check them out. David Meyer is in the back here who runs FSI. And we worked on a lot of projects together. So everything from exploring how cultivated meat companies could be more collaborative and strategically share IP, we're creating an industry-wide Marcoms organization. And I did, essentially did a research deep dive to understand the potential of blended meat. And kind of through that process, we did consumer research and market research and product development work, et cetera. And every week that went by, I just increasingly felt optimistic about the potential of blends. And so now I'm starting my own company in the space. Um, so if you're excited, I'd love to talk with you. I want to find amazing co-founders, marketing experts, product developers, investors, advisors, consultants. So if you're interested, I'd love to chat more. Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Greg Dodson. Um, I am the vice president of North America Savory at ADM. Uh, as part of my area of responsibility, I oversee the activities that we have in this space around uh, both blended and hybrid products. 
Uh, we've actually been spend, spending a, quite a bit of time in this space. Uh, we've conducted quite a few consumer surveys. Uh, and actually, we've been taking that information and we've been working with our product development and applications team uh, with the purpose of meeting with our B2B customers, uh, with showing them great tasting products, uh, showing them labels that have been approved for both nutrition and claims, and then also showing them all the data that we have around consumers to really help them decide which products to launch, uh, but then also uh, helping them speed up their commercialization process. So a pretty exciting category, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Oh, is, this, is this working? Okay. Uh, I'm Joanna Bromley. I'm co-founder and EVP of finance of the Better Meat Co. And what we do is we ferment mycelium. We create mycoprotein ingredients that we sell to large food companies. And they take that ingredient, and they can make fully animal-free products, or they can make blended products, which is actually one of our preferred methods, and I can get into that a bit later. But... Um, so my background is in finance and management consulting. I started my career as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, um, and um, then I, after, it was after I was an economics major at Duke, so I was very interested in, in the business world, and uh, spent some time also at Bain & Company as a management consultant. And as a background to this, a backdrop to this, I came to the plant-based world um, through some health issues I had when I was a teenager in my 20s, and I switched to a plant-based diet in a completely transform my health. And so that was the initial, uh, I guess, entrance for me. And then I started educating myself about the animal welfare aspects of it, the environmental aspects of it. And I uh, went to Harvard Business School while I was there, co-founded a company that was focused on reducing food waste. Got very excited about entrepreneurship and the food world. Um, went back to Bain, moved, back to, moved to California, and that's when Paul and I met. Paul is my co-founder and the CEO of the Better Meat Co., and he convinced me to quit my job at Bain and move to Sacramento, which is where our company is located. So that was back in 2018. It's been over five years now. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saba Fazeli. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Momentum Foods. We're doing business as Paul's Table on the retail side. Uh, I joined Beyond Meat uh, in 2017 as the first engineer on their R&D team back when there were like 20 people or so. Uh, I have two degrees in mechanical engineering and uh, have been friends with Bryce, who's sitting here, my co-founder, uh, for a long time. The TLDR on what we do, uh, we are trying to minimize the inclusion of animal ingredients in a blended product. So our approach is to use approximately 90% plant-based product, and then the last 10% we add pure beef fat, collagen, and broth components, all waste streams of meat production, but with the goal primarily of addressing the taste requirement and flavor requirement of the consumer. Um, folks who eat meat are the people that we collectively at this conference are trying to get through to. Um, and I, I think not letting the enemy be the perfect, uh, sorry, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good um, when thinking about how to reduce significantly is really important. Uh, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to ask, start with Prendy first here on providing some context on blended meat. Um, why blended meat? Um, you know, we've seen so many plant-based products improve over the last decade, um, as well as innovations from technologies like fermentation and cultivated meat. So what's the potential impact on blended meat, from blended meat on our food system? Okay, so first I'm going to ask everybody in the audience a question. So raise your hand if just generally speaking you want to eat a little bit healthier. And it's most people, um, as you're probably not too surprised. And there's a set of the population that really, really cares about eating healthier. They consistently say in surveys they want to eat healthier, they want to eat more plant-forward foods, and they self-identify as flexitarians. We've seen for years and years and years in surveys that about 10 to 30 percent of the U.S. population identifies as flexitarians, which has always been surprising to me. And when you really dig in and look at the consumer research as well as the market research, there's a few key takeaways that have really inspired me to go into the blended space. So first, looking at the consumer research, a vast majority of them, around 90% of those people, say that they want to eat more plant-forward, healthy protein, but they're frustrated by current products that are specifically designed for vegans. And when you look at the market research, it's not just lip service. A lot of people have tried plant-based meat. Some studies show that around 140 million Americans have tried plant-based meat, many of them trying it several times. 
that that doesn't just happen on accident. I think there's something deep and real inside people that's that's drawn to these products. But what we also see is that most people buy plant-based meat, these flexitarians, they buy incredibly sporadically. So often just a few times a month, often one to three times a month. And pretty much for the rest of the meals, they're, they're eating meat. And so when asking what does it take to convert those purchases from monthly to daily, which is where we're going to have our real impact, four things need to be true. The products have to taste amazing. They have to taste as good as meat or better. The products have to genuinely feel healthier. That's the whole reason why people come to this category in the first place. They've got to compete on price. And the fourth point, I think this is a really important one, is that they have to connect on a, on a deep emotional level. They have to fit into people's identities. And so when looking at those four things, I think all of us here kind of st stepped back and thought, well, blends are this beautiful, elegant, simple solution that can really strategically achieve all four of those things and allow us to reach way more people than the, the fully vegan products. So that's why I'm excited about them. And um, Greg and Saba also wanted to ask you both the same question. What's the case for blended meat? Yeah, I guess I, guess I touched on this a little briefly uh, in my little intro there, but really to, to us or to me, it's very much a utilitarian argument that's putting the consumer first, right? Like. The goal is to get through to meat eating consumers and the things that they care about in this order are flavor, then price, and then health. And if you don't win or be on par with those things, then they're not gonna come back and buy it again. And unfortunately, I think that's, that's been somewhat a, a challenge in the plant-based industry. Like, the products weren't good enough for people who love to eat meat to come back. Um, and, and really, the, the case here is that if we can get to, to me, uh, if we can get like 10 times as many people to eat something that is 90% of the way there, that's nine times as much impact uh, from an environment perspective, from an animal lives lost perspective. Um, and that's, that's the goal. It is the trolley problem. Pull the lever. Yeah, I, I think for us, you know, we're pretty excited about blends because um, one is it's, it's exciting to be able to develop and grow a new category. And then also for us, it's really exciting to be able to provide protein solutions to a new growing category of products. And then also, you know, it's similar to what's already been mentioned on the panel, we do think that there is a need to develop products that address taste, texture, price, and nutrition uh, that previously have not been addressed. And then also we believe that, um, you know, consumers need more choices in terms of what they're going to choose to be eating healthier. And it doesn't have to be this all or nothing approach to being able to have those choices. And Saba, you mentioned a little bit about the environmental benefits here. Can you um, elaborate on the potential sustainability advantages of blending plant-based ingredients with meat and what key factors should be considered of when course. assessing their overall impact? Yeah, okay. Uh, disclaimer, all of this needs life cycle assessment to be able to have rigorous discussion about that does not exist. So I'm saying things that I think there have been LCAs done on plant-based companies or plant-based products that we have seen. I'm sure y'all are familiar with these things. There is no direct comparison. The vegan thing will always be better for the environment from an LCA perspective. But I just said this, uh, if you can get more people <laughs> to eat something that's most of the way there, um, there's a lot more impact potential in that. And I think shifting the way that we think around all or nothing solutions, like what Greg just said, is an important thing at this juncture. Um, climate change is very real. We all know this. Uh, we have to figure out how to get through to the mass market. Yeah. Yeah, and there's just an opportunity there too to, you know, consumers' habits often shift quite a bit. So there, I think blended meat really has this opportunity to kind of meet those, you know, meet those folks in the middle um, in terms of nutrition and um, accessibility and sustainability. Speaking of nutrition, Joanna, I wanted to ask you um, from a nutritional standpoint, what are the potential advantages and challenges of blended meat products? And you also mentioned um, the preferred method for better meat was to work with meat. So I wanted you to elaborate more there too. Sure. So I think one of the great things about blended options is that, you know, you, you have less cholesterol, less saturated fat, but you're doing it with a stealth 
strategy, a stealth health strategy. So, and I'm specifically referring to, let's say you have a product that is, you know, it's plant protein, blend, or it could be microprotein blended with, with some type of meat, and you, you can't see the difference, you can't taste the difference. So you're providing an option for consumers, and they don't have to consciously make a different decision. So they don't have to choose the vegan option. They can choose something that it looks exactly the same, it tastes exactly the same. I think one of the challenges with this, though, is that it almost makes the, um, the, taste, stress, the taste threshold higher because it has to be virtually indistinguishable. Otherwise, you know, it'll be rejected, particularly for people who really enjoy eating meat. So that's, that's an issue. And so for our company, actually, when, when Paul approached me to start the company, his idea was about hybridizing meat or blending meat. And um, the reason that we prefer this is just from a pragmatic perspective, we think it'll be a lot more effective. So if you, you know, we're working with large uh, food companies, meat companies. So let's say you take, you know, one of our customers and they were to include, let's say they're making a, um, a chicken nugget. And actually, I can give you an actual example. So we work with Purdue Farms. We commercialized a product with them using a, a plant protein line that we, we started a few years back. And so the product, it's called Chicken Plus. It's a blended chicken nugget. It's part plant protein. It's part Purdue chicken. And um, it tastes amazing. It, ha- it got an award from the Food Network. It's the best, ch- best tasting chicken nugget. Um, and we prefer this option because we just think it's a lot more pragmatic. The, the number of people that you can reach is much higher, and so the potential impact is much higher. And then even for me, like looking at it from a business perspective, from a, like a revenue and a profit perspective, it's just a much higher opportunity. And so I think we're, um, even if you look at the processed meat market, it's like almost a trillion dollars just in the U.S. alone. So if we could even tackle a tiny bit of that, it would have a massive impact. So then opening this up to everyone here, um, what types of blended products would resonate most with consumers? Sabo, you want to give it a go? Um, I, th- I think it's that's a multi-billion-dollar question. Um, I will say that, but I, I do. I don't know. I, I might say this again later, but either way, being incredibly transparent about what is in the products, uh, I think, is a really important part of bringing this out to market. Like the type of blend, meaning whether it's ground beef uh, mixed with vegetables, or it's uh, what we're doing where we're adding byproducts, etc., or, or cell culture even, which is what we call hybrid now. Um, I think really the key to any and all of those approaches is just being incredibly straightforward with the end consumer about what they are eating. Um, I think that's that's something that kind of has been brought to light uh, in, in the whole rise of plant-based. Folks don't love seeing long ingredient lists with things that they can't pronounce. Um, that's been our experience when we, we were selling in retail in the Bay Area and LA and Salt Lake City. Um, and when we tell folks what's in the product and they look at the back, they're like, oh, I know what beef fat is. I know what collagen is. I know what soy and wheat and brown rice proteins are. Cool. And then they try it and then they buy it, which is really cool. Um, but just being transparent, I think, is really, really critical. Um, yeah. uh, Greg, from your consumer surveys, what have you found? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, a lot of our activity right now has been um, prioritized based off of the consumer research that we've done. And, and really what we did was we took the flexitarian and then we broke it out into the sub-segments. And, and really what we saw was that that flexitarian that leans more toward the meat-heavy type of diet, uh, they told us that they actually want to see meat as the number one ingredient on the label. They want meat as a majority of the product. Um, they want to eat healthy, uh, but they also want to make sure that they don't lose that meat experience or they want to make sure that you know, that meat taste is still there. Uh, so that's really where we've been prioritizing our efforts thus far. Uh, in a few months, we'll then move over to the feedback that we got from the flexitarian that leans more towards a plant-heavy diet. And what those consumers told us is they actually want a product that meat isn't the number one thing on the label. Um, they don't want a product that has more than 40% meat. Um, they're also looking to eat healthier. Um, but they also told us that they want to see things like plant protein, uh, wholesome ingredients, and also vegetables in their product without losing the taste. Um, in terms of formats, uh, what the research told us is that they still expect to see blends in uh, chicken nuggets, chicken tenders, beef patties, and then to a le- lesser extent, meatballs, uh, sausages, hot dogs. And then also I think what was interesting from the research that we did is that consumers don't want to pay less money than meat for these products. Uh, they want to pay the same as meat or they want to pay a premium. And the idea is that they don't want to have the perception that you took a really great tasting meat product and somehow you made it cheaper. 
And so that's what our research has been telling us. What do you think would contribute to creating that price parity? Is it just the quality of the different ingredients? Is it the processes? What do you think that would be? Yeah, I think, you know, so far with our product development and applications team, I mean, depending on the non-meat components that we're putting in with the meat, we, we have shown that you can easily meet price parity with meat with, with some of the plant proteins or some of the other ingredients that we've been putting in. Uh, so we do think meat parity, price parity is achievable. Uh, I think the question becomes from a positioning standpoint, you know, getting the right claims, describing it in the right way, communicating in a way that the consumer can really understand why they're buying it, I think will really help drive up that price point. Um, Prendy, did you have anything to add to, um, you know, what types of blended products would resonate? I think I agree with what they said. Great. And Joanna, I know this question is also pertaining to you too. What have you been seeing? So it's interesting because this, this space has not been defined, so this is just my own pontification on it. But um, I know there are a lot of products on the market that are, you can clearly see that it's blended. So you can take a burger, for example, that's blended with mushrooms. You can look at it. You can see that it's blended with mushrooms. And then there are other products where you can't tell the difference if you look at it, if you taste it. And I think there's a space, there's a place for both of those types of products. So if you think about the, you know, the indistinguishable chicken nugget, for example, that would be a great application for K through 12 public schools. You can get kids to eat a little bit healthier without them knowing. Uh, whereas maybe the burger that's clearly blended with vegetables or with mushrooms, maybe that would be good in a corporate cafeteria where you have people who are more curious about this type of thing and they would be okay with trying something that looks a little bit different. So then for um, going a little bit deeper into blend type, um, Saba, this question I wanted to ask you, does the blend matter? Um, what types of blends resonate most with consumers? Yeah, uh, The latter half of the question I might skip, but um, I, perhaps obviously from what I've said thus far, I do think the blend matters if our goal in doing this is to try to make an impact on the environment, right? Like the... From an LCA perspective, right, the, the, and I'm going to just say what I think about sustainability. I think sustainability is defined as a ratio of a product's utility uh, to its detriment to the environment. Meat production, the goal of meat production is to produce meat, right? Utilizing byproducts or waste streams from that is something that to me makes a lot of sense because we're effectively upcycling like lost streams that are currently going into like beauty applications or pet food or whatever. Um, and, and over time, in, in, again, in my opinion, I think the goal of R&D in this space is to try to minimize as much as possible, right? Like we picked 90%, it's around there. Like we picked that because it, it worked and it tasted good. Um, we tried more, we tried less, but I, I do think there's a lot of formulation and food science effort that needs to go in to how to optimize or utilize the animal ingredients that we are choosing to include. And then being very conscious about which ones we are including. I will then backpedal and actually try to answer the second part. Um, I, I, this space is burgeoning, right? We're, we haven't defined it. Um, I don't think that being prescriptive about how to do it, especially because the whole point of the blended space is to open the spectrum, right? Right now we're living in meat or vegan. Um, I, I don't want to be too prescriptive about what I think is the right thing to do. I think a lot of different things should be tried and we should listen to the consumer. That's what matters. And I guess speaking of listening to the consumer, I did see um, a few folks, uh, they uh, answered the poll question. However, I couldn't really see what the percentage of responses were, so I apologize for <laughs> not giving you a clear answer there. Um, but uh, I wanted to then move into some of the barriers and even success strategies in this um, in this segment. Um, this question's for Joanna and Saba. Um, we've seen companies and products enter and exit the blended space in the U.S. over the last few years, and just a handful of these products are on retail shelves. So my question is, why hasn't this category really taken off yet, and or what's held it back? And what do you think needs to happen for it to really grow? I'll go first. Um, so I'm going to go with what I know, which is our product. It's called Chicken Plus. It's a 
collaboration with Purdue Farms, um, and it's it's been performing very well. It's on 7,000 grocery stores across the U.S., and I think the reason, and we think the reason that it's doing so well is because it's not marketed as blended, it's not marketed as less meat, it's marketed as chicken plus. So you're getting Purdue chicken, the chicken that you know and love, plus plant protein. And we think that's vitally important because even just if you think from a consumer perspective, I can only speak from the U.S., but I think people respond to getting more, not less. So if you market it as, oh, you're going to get less meat, uh, it's just not as appealing versus if you're getting more nutrition. It's protein-packed. It's plant-powered, that type of language. Um, and I, I think that's why it's doing well. And I, you know, if you look at some of the other products that haven't done as well, I think maybe there could be some, some tweaks that could be made around the margins there. And then, um, I mean, even if you think about environmental claims, for example, like I would imagine, and I'm actually, I don't know what the data is on this, so I'm just saying this, but if something has a positive impact on the climate versus, you know, creating less emissions, I would wonder, like, how those different, you know, those two different uh, phrases would, would land with consumers. So it's, it's that type of thing of, of, you know, people think they're getting more, not less. I think uh, from our somewhat limited engagement with consumers over the last few months, um, I'll say a few things. One, I think this is a very unique moment in time where this concept is possible. Um, I think trying to present, or, and also, honestly, a lot of the products that have come out in the past were trying to present themselves as blends while the alternative meat space was becoming more common knowledge to the mass market consumer. Um, I, I, I know I said I worked at Beyond Meat. I truly believe we are standing on the shoulders of giants because what has happened, thanks to companies like Beyond, Impossible, all the players in this space, is that people understand what plant-based is. And so now our pitch to consumers when we're demoing tacos in a grocery store is really straightforward. Like I always open with, have you heard of plant-based? And they're like, yeah. And then I'm like, cool, we just added some beef fat and collagen back into it so it tastes like what you want, but you still get all the health and environmental benefit. And they're like, great. <laughs> and we've actually been outselling the, the, the meat uh, competitors in the refrigerated category that we're in, in the stores that we are currently selling in, which is really exciting. Um, that brings me to the, the secondary point which is that I think the health angle, Perenda, you brought this up earlier, that's, that's also very critical, and, also, and how you present it um, as a win, again, like adding to the experience for a consumer is really significant, right? Like we, we point to our macros, and a lot of folks who pick up our packs look and say, wow, that's a lot of protein and very little fat and almost no cholesterol, and it tastes really good. Like, duh, I'm going to try this. Um, and then they buy it. And I think do, doing that and figuring out how to package that in communication strategies is really important um, as we continue to expand the space. Yeah, yeah Joanna, to your point, the, the plus part, um, which we've seen a little bit in you know, the egg space and the milk space where it's you know, fortified, fortified milk, fortified eggs. Um, it'd be, it's interesting to see that in the meat space so that you have some added nutritional benefit that I think could play a really big role in this category. Um, so actually, I did get the polls to start working. Um, so 55% of you it's, uh, had said that you're somewhat familiar with blended meat. So that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, shed some insight on to where this, where this space could go. And so I wanted to then um, move over to Greg on uh, a little bit more on the consumer research. Um, who is the blended consumer? You mentioned a little bit more on like the flexitarian and meat eater side. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how blended meat products can unlock new consumer groups, if that's possible. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, what we feel today is probably the consumer group that has the biggest attraction to blends is the flexitarian. And depending on where you fit in that flexitarian space, uh, you know, what I talked about earlier will depend on what you view the composition of those products to be. Uh, but we also feel there's a lot of potential, you know, as the team has talked about earlier, around uh, you're really bringing back those consumers that have left the meat alt space or maybe those consumers that tried the meat alt but then didn't come back. And, and we also feel that if we can get the, the overall meat experience right, whether it's, you know, it's a combination of things. Really, it's about appearance. It's about taste. It's about aroma. It's about texture. And if we can get all of those things right, I think you start to then bring in more of the meat eaters into the blended category. 
Prenda, did you have something to add? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, two things. One, I love that there are so many people here, and there's a bunch of people outside, and I feel like they can't hear us. And I see eight chairs here. Yes, come in. So come you in. guys should come in, there's, get comfortable. Um, yeah, I can add two things. One is that I think it's also interesting to think about who's not going to be having these blended products, which are vegetarians and vegans, which is great because we're reducing meat from those who would otherwise be having a fully meat product. Um, and one more time, just raise your hand if you want to eat healthier. Um, and then keep your hand raised if you want to do so without sacrificing taste. And keep your hand raised if you want to do that, um, if you generally believe that plant-based meats or plant-based foods are a little healthier than animal-based foods. And if you were all participating, your hands would be raised right now, but a lot of you are not participating. This is not how I envisioned it going. But pretty much everyone's hand would be raised. And the fourth question I was going to ask was, um, do you not want to give up meat? And maybe this room is not the most representative of the U.S. population, but if I asked most people in the world, they would keep their hands raised for all four of those questions. And I think that speaks to kind of what Greg was just saying. Like, conceptually, if we can pull it off and achieve all four of those things, like, a lot of people are all in. And when we ask flexitarian specifically, as you were mentioning, um, would you prefer to sporadically have plant-based meat products like you're doing today, like once or twice a month? Or would you rather regularly, daily, have blended products that combine meat and these plant ingredients? A vast majority of them prefer the latter. So they, they just don't have that option right now. So they're kind of like doing what they have with the products that are in the market. But I think if we can really deliver that, um, we'll be able to, to reach a lot more people. May I, may I jump in for a second? I think uh, another important thing to think about in, in this, and Perendi, I like how you just said, like moving from a sporadic consumption to like more daily or regular consumption. Uh, I think the type of product, Greg Gilson mentioned this earlier, the type of product is very important uh, in, in how to go about that, right? Like uh, maybe this is controversial, but I don't think burgers make sense. <laughs> I don't think chicken makes that much sense either um, because if you think about the three things consumers care about again, right, flavor, price, and health, you have to somehow win uh, or be as good, be as good on two and better on one. Uh, and for indulgence products like a burger, I, I presume like Perendi's uh, little survey just now, not many of you eat burgers regularly, but a lot of people I think are similar. Not many people eat a burger all the time. And so thinking about what the user experience of the product you're trying to replace is, um, I think it's really important. So, so folks who don't eat burgers all the time, why would they want to compromise on their indulgence moment when they're having a burger with cheese and bacon and avocado that's $20 versus f focusing on convenience-driven health products that can be the Tuesday or Wednesday night or Thursday night meal? Um, that's why we're, we're in the refrigerated entree category. We chose to launch there because that's kind of the purpose of that space. Like, dinner in five minutes, lunch in five minutes. Um, I think this is a very important thing to think about too as we launch in the market. So I wanted to incorporate some of our audience questions here. Um, we hadn't really talked about labeling or regulatory. So I, one of our audience members asked if there are any regulatory or labeling challenges that are unique to blended meat products. Not an expert on this, but uh, it really depends on what ingredients you are blending with and how much. I believe the definition for needing to be in a USDA facility, huh? It's 2%? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. 2% raw meat or greater. Um, that's one of the reasons why we picked byproducts because uh, it gives us some freedom in that. Uh, I think the conversation around blending with cell culture is a whole other one that has probably been uh, beaten to a pulp in this context, but I won't comment on that too much. <laughs> I can, so again, I'm also not an expert on this, but um, so what's interesting about this is that it gets, it almost gets to the point of being transparent with consumers. So depending on the type of meat you're talking about, whether it's processed or not, there are different standards of identity. And this is different in the U.S. versus other countries as well. So let's take tuna as an example. To call something tuna, it has to be a, per, a specific percent actual tuna. Now, I don't know what that percent is, but I know that th this is the case for many different types of meat. So, you know, if you, if you target a type of meat that maybe the standard of identity is, is a little bit looser, um, 
that would be an opportunity to be able to get directly to consumers and have, you know use that stealth health strategy. But then it also gets to that point of like how how transparent is that? So it is a bit of a, a challenge, um, of, I guess, balancing those two things. I mean, the the like alt dairy space, and and I think even the alt protein space has been attacked by big meat um, around the communication or labeling, right? You, uh, I think there was what was the case in Missouri about how uh, they didn't want plant-based meat to be called meat because it's not meat. Uh, technically, that was that did not go through because First Amendment says you can say whatever the hell you want so long as you say what it actually is on the back of the pack. Um, so we are benefited by that too. Well, that kind of that leads into my next question about communication and um, and marketing these products um, specifically to. Rendy and Saba, um, what are the core challenges? And then we'll open this up as well. But what are the core challenges in marketing blended products to consumers? What have you seen so far? Um, I think what Joanna said is really spot on, that people don't want necessarily want to eat less meat, but they want to eat more healthy plant-forward foods. So I think in the past we've seen marketing um, that's really advertised the products as being like reduced meat, and those really haven't landed well. So I think that's, that's super important. Um, I think these products need to really connect, as I mentioned before, on like a deeper emotional level. With meat, we're not motivated by cognition, but by our deep, unconscious desire for satisfaction. So products that really land that, I think, are going to be the ones that are the most successful. Some products are blending um, with super, super healthy ingredients like kale and spinach and things like that. And while I love it conceptually, I don't think those products are going to be super successful. One, because they don't feel as intuitive or natural to mix meat with those ingredients. And also because they um, create a different sensory experience. So the color is a little bit different from what people are used to. The texture is a little bit different. Um, so companies that really have like a taste-first approach, I think, are the ones that are going to win in this space. Uh, full transparency, we have spent almost no dollars uh, doing any digital marketing. Uh, we are tiny as a company. The, our focus, and what I will say, is that generating trial or creating opportunity for people to try the thing is like by far and away the most significant way or easy way to get through to folks. Like me or Bryce standing in a grocery store being like, hey, you want a free taco? Like, if you don't like it, like we'll we'll we'll, we'll just do push-ups or something. That's what Bryce says. Um, <laughs> and usually people try it. Uh, that that's been really important. I do also want to make a note about brand presentation. And I think Perenda, you bring up a really good point about the emotional appeal of products like this. And thinking about brand presentation, there's a reason why uh, we we changed our retail-facing brand from Momentum Foods to Paul's Table. Um, Paul's Table is named after Bryce's father, who passed away a few years ago. Um, Rest easy, Paul, but either way. Uh, the thought behind that was that f folks don't want to eat science meat, especially people who are meat eaters. They want to eat good food. Uh, and so brand presentation as an emotional thing, saying, hey, we're going to give you good food, um, I think is a really important way to get through to people who are skeptical about the space, who ultimately are, that's our target. Like, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Do you think provenance will play a role here in blended space where people want to know where the where the meat's from or where the proteins come from or um, is, you know you, you see that a lot with um, with with the meat industry right you know you have a lot of curiosity on where the animal was raised um, where it lived and so a little bit kind of that farm to table I guess but my question is, yeah, do you think provenance is something that will um, impact the success of this category? I come back to what I was saying about product choice or like the types of products to sell. Joanna, you said this earlier, like playing in the processed meat space, it, 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 there's a reason that we are choosing to do that because if you look at the existing incumbent meat options, they're by no means ethically raised, single source, clean, any of that. Folks who are buying those products don't really care, um, which fortunately we're leveraging at this point. But I do hope and think that as this category develops over the years that there is ample opportunity to fold that in. Um, like for us, like I, I have a, a lot of vegan friends uh, and they ask me if we source ethically uh, raised animal ingredients. 
And my answer to them very bluntly is right now, no, because we can't afford it. <laughs> Our margins would tank if we tried to do that. Um, over time, I think that is totally a reasonable thing to do. But at this juncture, right, flavor, price, health. And if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. You know, that's, that's it. I think to everyone's uh, point here on taste, uh, the poll figures came through and 42% voted taste as the most compelling benefit or characteristic to blended meat, followed by sustainability at 31. So interesting figures. Um, so I wanted to then move into... Um, you know, meat has such significance or just, you know, food culture, especially in the U.S., is so diverse. You know, we have such a variety of cuisines to try that use a blend of meat and plants, right? So, Perendi and Greg, I wanted to ask this question to you. Um, how do you anticipate consumers from various cultural backgrounds how how they would perceive and embrace blended meat products and what cultural factors should um, manufacturers consider when marketing these products? Yeah, I can, I can go first. Uh, you know, I think we looked at this question more on a, on a global perspective. And even though we haven't been able to do a lot of research around just cultural specific questions, um, you know, what we have found is there's a lot of interest really around the globe for blends. And even if you look at the flexitarian, um, I think in the U.S. it's about 73% of flexitarians are very interested in trying blends, purchasing blends. In Europe, it's about 65 to 70%. In Brazil and China, it's in the lower 80s. And so we do see this global uh, willingness by flexitarians to really try and, and embrace blends. So even though we don't have like the actual cultural data, we do feel just based off of what we've done globally with our, our research, we do think that... Um, you know, this space can really uh, resonate with a lot of cultural backgrounds around the world. Yeah, I can give a, a simple answer here. Um, as I'm sure you can tell by now, I think everyone wants to eat healthier. Everyone wants to eat more plant-forward foods. Um, and I think that that's kind of agnostic to what culture you're talking about. And I think something that's really unique and special about blends is that they allow you to enhance meat products and really make creative kind of special products. Um, so some things that we're exploring are like in the southern category, a smoked te Texas brisket with red cabbage and sage, or like a bourbon bacon artichoke pork link, or an Italian truffle mushroom. Like you can make these really special products that I think people can get people really excited. May I jump in too quickly? Absolutely. I think if the products are good, then they will integrate into cultural expectations of meat. Um, I was a vegan for a while, and the reason I stopped is because I came home from L.A. to the Bay Area. And my mom had made, I, I'm, my parents are from Iran, uh, she had made uh, one of my favorite foods that has chicken in it. And I showed up at home, and I was like, damn, who am I to say no to this? And uh, I just reduce a lot now. <laughs> uh, but I think that's, that's a pretty ubiquitous experience. I also, and I like that you brought up the Asian market thing, uh, fish cakes as an example, right? Like post-Korean War, that that's one of the first examples of true blending, and it was simply out of necessity. Um, there's a lot of acceptance, I think, around the world for this type of concept. Yeah. I wanted to, we kind of touched on a little bit about um, nomenclature uh, throughout our conversation, but I wanted to ask, uh, you know, how can companies work collabor collaboratively with either regulatory agencies or consumer advocacy groups uh, to establish clear and standardized uh, technical nomenclature for blended meat products that are, you know, translated, I guess, from the food science, you know, realm. So, Greg, I wanted to open that up to you first. Yeah, absolutely. I think when it comes to nomenclature, you know, some of the terms that we've tested with consumers uh, are, are going to be blends, but then also hybrids. And what we found is that consumers by far and large prefer the term blend over hybrid. Uh, but then also, you know, we've been working with the USDA through label submission. So as we develop products internally as part of our B2B business, 
We've been going one step further and then even submitting claims to the USDA with labels and working with them to figure out what they're allowing us to say and, and what they're not allowing us to say. And then going back and forth with, <clears throat> with, with different reiterations of those, of those. And so that process is actually working out really well for us. And, and so I would encourage the industry to continue to do that approach. Uh, we're also starting to reach out to regulatory authorities around the world with a similar approach, with submitting labels, having that correspondence going back and forth. And I think once we've been able to do that, I think we'll get a really good picture of where things are today. And then I think then we can start to prioritize and bring in industry groups or consumer groups to really help us better shape the overall industry. Are you able to say what, what you're able to, to print on the label versus not? Uh, I think what I can talk about, because we're still working through uh, what can you call it and then how can you describe it. Uh, but what we have been able to do is really work with just the comparison claims, which I think are also very valuable. So, for example, if you're putting together a product that's 60% meat, 40% plants, you can still do that comparison data with 100% 80-20 beef, as an example. And even a 60-40 blend still gets you a 30 to 40% reduction in fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, and calories. Uh, but those are some of the things that we're currently working on. Can I have something? Um, Having been in the cultivated space for a while, I've seen a lot of names come and go, and I think we're going to see something similar for this category. So through FSI, we did some research on this. We did a pretty extensive um, research to try to figure out a name for the category. Um, and so surprisingly, we found a lot of people, when we said blended meat, they thought of like meat blended together, like a smoothie or something like that, and it was really repulsive to a lot of people. I don't know if you, you saw that in your research. No, we haven't. Interesting. Yeah, we, we saw a lot of people say that. Um, we found that the term that consumers liked most was this idea of flex meat or flexitarian meat, um, which was interesting, not something that I had thought about. Um, there's also, uh, I'm excited about this idea of craft meat or crafted meats, where you're kind of like crafting together different select ingredients that feels kind of premium and intentional. Um, so yeah, I think we're, it's going to evolve, but just wanted to share our insights. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, do you foresee... You know, I think a lot of the plant-based scene has caught a lot of stigma against the term processed. Um, is this something that you foresee in the blended space? Um, you know, and if so, you know, what's what are what are ways to really kind of overcome that and 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 clarify to the consumer? I'd say a couple of things about this. Uh, first of all, I have two degrees in mechanical engineering, and it frustrates me to no end. <laughs> that people get frustrated or uh, have qualms with the phrase or word processed foods. It makes no sense because if an apple was taken off a tree, it's processed, right? means nothing. Uh, regardless, I think the perception around this, uh, and, and this is, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, like a lot of it comes down to the back of label <laughs> and the ingredient list, right? Like people, if people can't identify what's, what the ingredients are in that list, they'll assume the worst, uh, and usually that conversation gets conflated with super processed. Um, like, we all know, I'm sure you all know, extrusion is pretty simple. Um, it is processing, though, uh, and, and folks who we chat with, when we say we make textured proteins that integrate these ingredients, they're like, cool, great, at least I know what the ingredients are. Um, so I think that's important. I would love for there to be a shift around that <laughs> in mass market, but difficult. So I, I really don't see this as a problem, at least in the near term, because I guess it depends on what products that you're trying to, to formulate. But if, you're, if we're targeting the processed meat market, then people already know it's processed, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good point. 100%. Yeah. That's true. And I guess with, to what you and Greg were saying, Joanna, you know, seeing the blended meat category kind of grow with more of the processed meat products like, you know, um, chicken nuggets or hot dogs. That could be kind of a way in, it sounds like, to a, a broader market. I think it's the best way in because, I mean, it's it, if you're going to eat a hot dog, you're not really that concerned with what's in it because clearly <laughs> it's not good. So, I mean, if you can come up with something where, hey, we can add, you know, 10%, 20%, some type of alternative protein to it and it doesn't taste any different, then I don't see why anybody would have a problem eating it. So, But it would be better for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 A healthier hot dog. Yeah. Who knew? 
Um, so then I wanted to take another audience question here um, and opening this up to the, to the group. Do blended products have an opportunity to utilize existing production infrastructure for scale up or will they require unique processing and production equipment that's more similar to true alternative protein products? Who would like to start? I guess I just said the word extrusion, so I'll there happily jump in there. Um, I mean, uh, the question, okay, so existing production capacity or existing technology, meaning like meat processing stuff? Um, uh, it, it, yes, okay. yes. I presume that's what that meant. Yes. Um, the answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends on what type of product you're making. Uh, in general, though, like I'm sure you've, Johnny, you've seen this. Like, if we're talking about having good margins, uh, you want to simplify your process as much as possible because every step implies a cost. Uh, and utilizing existing equipment instead of designing custom large pieces of equipment and draining your bank account doing so is definitely the way to do that if you're a small company. Um, if you're a huge, huge company, okay. But uh, for us, our customization is in the extrusion tooling. Uh, I, that's my background. I did dye design, um, and that's what we do. Uh, we make custom tooling to make textured proteins, but then everything else we use in our process is very widely available pieces of equipment because that lowers the barrier to entry. Yeah. So do you think blended, blended meat, or I guess, Joanna, I'm curious because you, you, you mentioned your work with Purdue. Um, is this, you know, what, what's the collaborative process like working with conventional meat producers? So, I mean, we started working with them right from the beginning of the company, and they were very open to collaborating with us. And I think a lot of large meat companies are, because if you think about it, I mean, ultimately, for many of them, they're public. Their ultimate goal is to increase profits. If they can find something that's a great product that people love, they're on board. And so you could even think about them as their protein companies. They're not necessarily meat companies. And a lot of them are moving in that direction. Um, so the actual process itself, it was extremely collaborative. So we had a partnership with their R&D department. We co-developed the product. They were with us, and we were with them every step of the way. So it really was a jointly developed product. Um, and, you know, so far, so good. We've, we've continued to sell our ingredients to them, and the product is performing very well. So then I wanted another question I thought was um, was interesting um, from an audience member. They ask, how far along is the industry in scaling up from lab scale to industrial production? And are blended products seen as complementary to or in competition with existing alternative protein products? take a stab at the second half of that. Um, in our experience talking to customers um, or folks that go to grocery stores and want to buy stuff, uh, it absolutely not. Uh, I, don't, I don't see much competition happening whatsoever. A lot of the folks we talk to say that they tried plant-based, they didn't like it, and they weren't going to buy it again. And then we we're like, you should try this. You might like it. And they do. And then they're like, oh, cool. This is a different thing. Um, I'd be hard-pressed to imagine that a lot of vegan folks would be interested in trying our products. Um, but, again, I do think having more options is important here, right? Like, this is not a zero-sum game. <laughs> uh, we are not taking away market share. It is building a category. Um, yeah, and then to, to go to the, the scale-up thing, like, really depends how much experience you have doing scale-up with the processes that you work with. Um, for us, we could very easily make a large amount of stuff if we had the capital to do so. Mm -hmm. We don't yet, um, but we'll get there, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would say for the first part of the question, like there really isn't a blended meat category yet. I think it's something we're all really excited to build. There's a handful of companies that are at different stages. I would say the Better Meat Co. is the farthest along. They're in the most stores, I'm guessing, um, have big partnerships, but there's a few other smaller startups in the space. So I think in the next few GFI conferences, we can answer that more as a category, but right now there's just we're just at the very beginning. Yeah. And then one more question from the audience. Um, they ask if a product needs to be a traditional meat product 
to be in the category. And I know, Prendy, you just mentioned this is still kind of a no man's land at this point, very new. Um, but I guess then, yeah, like does it does a product need to be a traditional meat product to, to work in this space? Opposed to cultivated? I guess, yeah, I guess opposed to cultivated. So cultivated then um, would be the hybrid, right? If you have a hybrid meat, it's going to be a blend of cultivated meat and plant proteins. So I guess that kind of answers that question. Um, yeah, I think the yeah. goal for all of us is to eventually reduce the amount of conventional meat and increase the amount of cultivated or the best plant-based meat that's out there. Um, but right now we're all using conventional meat because we think that's what delivers on those key things of taste and price and health. So I, maybe I, I heard the question differently, but at least my interpretation was, well, do you have to use, you know, do you have to go to um, a meatball or a sausage, which is a traditional meat product? Um, I mean, honestly, I would say the answer is yes, because it's very difficult to get people to try new things. So if you can create something that already exists and just make it a little bit better, I think that's a lot more palatable for, for most consumers. Yeah, and, and the research that we've done, I mean, consumers expect blends in the formats that they're familiar with, whether it's the nugget, the tender, the burger, the sausage, the meatball. Uh, that's where they're expecting blends today is those formats that they're already buying every day at, at the store. That's where they're expecting to see the blended products. And to the poll, uh, the last poll here, um, what level of impact do you think blended products might have in the broader alternative protein space? I think is interesting because it's tied. 40% said major impact and 40% some, um, which leads now. We have a few more minutes left. I wanted to just go down the line here and ask, you know, where you see blended meat in, you know, 2030. That's the overall theme here of the conference. Uh, Brendy, where do you see it going? Yeah, I have a um, pretty strong point of view on this. And, you know, looking even farther, it's looking like 50 or let's say 100 years into the future. It's really hard for me to envision how we got to that kind of our shared end goal without blends playing a critical role. I think people don't really jump from zero to 100. And so I think this is really strategic and kind of getting us to where we're all excited to go. I, it's kind of controversial, I am personally not that excited about the meat reduction in the short term. I don't think that's where the impact really excites me. But what I love about blends is how they kind of can uniquely and strategically create an environment and a culture where the entire alt protein sector can thrive. So I have a lot of ideas on how it can do that, but I won't go through all of them, but it's, I can mention a few of them. So one is that I think from a consumer psyche perspective, blends can really sh help like reshape the concept of meat in people's minds. I think blends can uniquely c create alliances with really influential people in our society. So think like really powerful climate and nutrition NGOs, government, strategic food service and retail providers, influencers, like I just can envision them rallying behind blends in a way that's hard for them to do for a fully vegan product today. And the third is that kind of what Joanna was saying, I think that to get to the shared end goal that we all have in mind, the most strategic and fastest way to get there is to partner with Big Meat. And I think that if we can figure out how we can really create shared incentives and in, like have the same bottom line, that's the most effective way to do that. And I think blends are really uniquely positioned to get us to that point. Yeah. When I think about blends in 2030, um, I think for some consumers it's going to be a bridge while the meat all industry continues to take advantage of technological advances to improve the products. Um, I also think for some consumers it'll be a bridge into hybrids. because I do think it's going to be easier for a consumer to move from a, a blend to a hybrid versus going straight from a meat product to a hybrid. And then I also think uh, long term, I just think there are going to be consumers that they do want a majority of their product to be meat, that they do want meat as the number one ingredient on the label. And so I do think there's still going to be room for those types of products in the space. Uh, and even I think even thinking about like 2050, where there's going to be 9.7 billion people on the planet, all of them are going to have nutritional needs, protein needs, and we're going to have to get pretty creative on how do we address those. And, and I think blends and blends with meat are going to be part of that. I think what would be interesting to see, and this is, I mean this is what I would hope is is that a blended, let's say, processed meat product would be the default option in different 
applications. So in K through 12 public schools, military, prisons, other food service uh, channels, I think that would be really impactful. Um, and I think it's very possible too. So if they're not necessarily willing to, you know, K through 12 public school, they don't want to switch to 100% plant-based chicken nuggets, maybe they'd be willing to switch to blended. That would be, a, that would have a massive impact. So I think that that would be a, that would be, I guess, success. I, I really like what you said, Greg, about setting the stage for hybrid. Um, I'm a big fan of cell cultured stuff. I don't think folks are ready for it yet. Um, obviously, it's not quite ready for market yet either. But in the same way that I said earlier that we are now entering the market with mass consumer understanding of what plant-based is, my hope is that in 2030, hybrid or cell culture can enter the market with understanding of what a blend is uh, and that we would be at the same point of, of generalized uh, acceptance of a blended option uh, by then. Uh, longer term, I, I really, I think what's really important is giving people options um, and just allowing our understanding of the fact that eating of steak every day is not good for the environment or you uh, to, to, to be the high level goal, right? Like, I don't think people are gonna stop eating steaks, but building this category and allowing it to flourish gives folks the opportunity to choose how much meat they want to eat. I would love for there to be a spectrum of options for people. And my hope uh, was working ever to be on meat for five, like I hope a lot of what people eat is plant-based. Like I really do. Um, I just think giving folks options is gonna be the way towards that, uh, that, that lasts. Great, thank you. Thank you panelists for doing the deep dive here. This was great and thank you audience members for participating. Um, it was great. Thank you again. Thank you.